now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Jed Peeler in Ely, Nevada, absolutely adores this show. Dana Andrews, Cold War drama, I Was a Communist for the FBI. This episode goes back to August 20th, 1952, and it's entitled The Red Record. I Was a Communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. The story you are about to hear is based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. Nine years. For nine long years, I played my part, like walking a tightrope in a circus. But if I fell, there wasn't going to be any net to save me. It's a lonesome, thankless job, trying to be a communist for the FBI. is Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked The Red Record. Oh, Comrade Matt, come in. <coughs> I went to a meeting of my communist cell. It was Tuesday, 9 p.m., there were six of us there, four men, two women. We went through all the reports, propaganda, the directives, and then Comrade Ted, the leader of our cell, had a word to say. Now just keep this in mind, comrades. The party expects nothing impossible. Just do what you're told. I think that's all. Good night. Oh, Comrade Matt, wait just a second, will you? Oh, me? Sure. It's done. Yes, Cameron. Have, uh, have you ever been in Chicago? I've passed through a couple of times, but that's all. Have you got any connections there, relatives? Anybody there know you? Not that I know of. Okay. <laughs> you know, Comrade, you're a pretty good-looking guy, and that isn't going to do any harm on the job we've got for you. What job? Well, the Central Committee decided, from what I told them about you, that you're the comrade to handle this foul-up. I don't understand. You don't have to understand. All you have to do is obey orders. Okay, what are my orders? Pack a bag full of clothes and be at the information desk at the Union Station at 1 a.m., four hours from now. Where am I going? Don't worry about it. Then, uh, how long will I be gone? Who knows, comrade? Maybe forever. <laughs> Comrade Ted gave me some money for expenses, and then we walked out to the street together. At the corner, we parted. Well, see you again, comrade. See you again, comrade. That's something that drives you crazy when you're supposed to be a communist and you're working for the FBI. See you again, comrade, they say. They'll see you again. That's one thing you can be sure of. I walked across town to the place where I lived and went up to my room. Hello? This is John F. Smith. I want to talk to Uncle Zack. Okay, Matt, go ahead. I'm being sent somewhere. I'm not sure, but I, I think it's Chicago. I'm supposed to make a contact at the Union Station at 1 a.m. You know what it's about? No idea. Uh -huh. Chicago. Yes, there's an operation in Chicago that we've heard about. I'll give you a number to call if you need it. Maybe you will. Uh, Michigan 91112. 
Michigan 91112. Uh, don't write it down. Just remember it. I'll remember. <laughs> One o'clock, I was waiting at the information desk in the Union Station. Track three for Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, Odie. Hello, comrade. Oh, comrade Ted. Here's your ticket and your reservation. The train's due now, so get going. Where am I going? Chicago. You'll be met at the station. Come on. Who's going to meet me? All I know. He'll say, hello, George. How's Aunt Agatha? How will he know me? Don't worry about that. He'll know you. Forward! Good luck, comrade. I stared out of the window at the lights flashing by in the night. Lights in the farmhouses, gas stations, and stores. Traffic lights. Auto lights. The lights of peace, I thought. And those are the lights we're trying to keep burning. George, how's Aunt Agatha? Mike was the man's name. Comrade Mike. He took me to his room in a boarding house. He took off his shoes and lit a pipe. He settled down in a chair with broken springs. Then he looked at me as if I were something in an aquarium behind glass. Interested, but unsympathetic. At his side, there was a record player, and he switched it on. Well... You don't mind a little music, comrade? Just in case somebody on the other side of the wall might be interested in our conversation. Uh, comrade Mike... Uh, just Mike will do. Oh, Mike, then. Mike, tell me, what goes on? Why did they send me here? You don't know? No idea. Well, now, comrades like this. There was this man named Jay, see? Comrade Jay, sort of theatrical producer and pretty high in the party. I don't know exactly why, but they kind of got the idea he was working with the other team. So, what happened? Well, poor Comrade Jay. He died. Oh, definitely, Comrade. You never saw a need of suicide. When I arrange a suicide, it's what I mean arranged. No, take your word for it, Comrade. But I, I still don't get the reason why they sent me here. Well, I'll tell you why. It's this way. Comrade Jay had a little black book with some names and addresses and notes in it. And I always carried it with him, but when we uh, found his body, it wasn't on him. It wasn't in his car, it wasn't in his room. You didn't find it? No, sir, we didn't. And the party's just got to have that book. And that's why we brought you here. Well, why me? Why bring me all the way here? Well, now, I tell you. The party brought you here because they think you got away with women. And you're a stranger. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a no, minute. No, 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 that's right, comrade. You see, Comrade Jay produced a show in a nightclub on South Wabash. The star of the show was a girlfriend of his named Gloria Dawn. Gloria Dawn. So? So the party believes Comrade Jay may have left that little black book with Gloria. Now, you're strange in town, and you're good-looking. It's up to you. You mean I'm supposed to get this girl to confide in me? And... Any way that you please, Comrade. But she hasn't got the book. Oh, she got it somewhere. And that's why you're here. To talk sweet to that dame until she tells you everything she knows. Okay. Where do I find her? He's working in a double or nothing club on the south side. You find her, and you talk to her, and... Your report to me will be good, I hope, comrade. Yeah, I'd find Gloria Dawn, and my report would be good. It would have to be. I'd been instructed by the comrade. The Double or Nothing Club was loud and strictly not for children under the age of 35. And now we take great pride in presenting the star of our show, Miss Gloria Dawn. Here she is. Let's give her a great big hand. just about what I expected, and I was not really surprised when I caught a glimpse of Comrade Mike in a far corner. 
I expected to be followed because the cameras just don't trust each other out of sight. After several hundred years, the floor show was over. Comrade Mike was still somewhere behind me, and in front of me was anything from simple flirtatious nonsense to sudden death. Poor Comrade Jay. I found my way backstage to the dirty corridor where the dressing rooms were. Yeah? Miss Dawn? Yeah? Remember me? No. Matt Svedek. I never saw you before, mister. May I come in? Lose yourself, chum. All right, I, I just wanted to talk to you about Jay. Jay? What about him? Do you think he killed him, Phil? Well, I... I... Come in. Uh... Sit down while I take off this makeup. What'd you say your name was? Matt Svetic. Oh, yeah. Mind if I ask? Are you a cop? No, certainly not. Why? And why are you asking me about Jay? Well, he was, uh, he was a friend of mine. I heard he was a friend of yours, that's all. Oh. You were a friend of his. How long did you know him? Well, it's, it's been years. I guess I first knew him right here in Chicago. He was a stinker. <laughs> sure. A real stinker. Of course he was, from the day he was born. Well, why'd you come back here to talk to me about Jay? It's just an excuse to meet you. Why? Because you're beautiful. At least I, I thought you were beautiful out there, but now that I see you closer, without your makeup, you're even more beautiful. <sighs> okay, honey. Wait for me outside. When I got home that night, I was questioned at length by Comrade Mike. What had I said to Gloria? What had she said to me? Where did we go when we left the nightclub? What was her reaction when I mentioned Comrade Jay? We know Comrade Jay had that book up the time he went into Gloria's dressing room. We know he didn't have it when he left. We've searched every inch of that dressing room, and we know it isn't there. We know Gloria didn't take it away with her. Gloria is exactly what she seems to be, a body without a brain. Look, Comrade, this assignment is nothing but trouble. I don't like it. Well? Suppose I don't find the book. Suppose you were dead, comrade. August 20th, 1952, I was a communist for the FBI on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Veterinary telemedicine is booming. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Teller, president of the American Veterinary Medical Association, and I know firsthand that telehealth is a valuable tool to help provide our precious pets with the health care they need and deserve. Here are some situations where telemedicine may be an option for you and your pet, if the veterinarian has seen your pet in person in the past, if you're not sure you need to schedule an in-person visit, if your pet had surgery and needs post-operative follow-up, for skin diseases and rash rechecks, when your veterinarian needs to monitor your pet's chronic problems such as diabetes or allergies, if there are behavioral issues or training challenges, or for hospice care. It's always good to have your session in a quiet place with good lighting. If you're not sure if you should set up a telehealth session, call your veterinarian and they'll let you know. To learn more, check out avma.org telehealth. avma.org telehealth. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of I Was a Communist with the FBI, August 20th, 1952. Now back to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sabetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI and the second act of our story. Just pretending to be a loyal member of the Communist Party was hard enough, but having to be a detective for the party was a little harder. A couple of days went by, Gloria and I were together day and night. I tried to get her to talk about Jay. She wanted to talk about herself. But on the third night, after the show in her dressing room... It... Close your eyes, honey. Roger. Eyes closed. Say, Gloria, hmm. why don't you think Jay killed himself? <laughs> Did I ever say that? You believe it, don't you? Oh, I don't know. Only I think he knew he was going to be knocked off that night. He came in here when I was dressing like now. 
He had a little portable radio with him. He put it down on the table there and said, This is for you, babe. If I never come back, this radio will play. He didn't come back and the thing wouldn't play. If I never come back, this radio will play. Yeah, that's what he said. Did you tell anybody about that? Tell who? The cops? I wouldn't tell them the time of day. What happened to the radio, Gloria? Mm, what did I do with the thing? This dressing room is so cluttered up. Uh, I guess I left it in the property room with all the costumes and junk. Do you think it's still there? What difference does it make? Oh, I, I thought I might be able to fix it for you. I know a little about radios. Yeah? Well, maybe it's still there. Come on. This is it. <laughs> it looks so beat up, I don't think you could sell it for a buck. You think you can fix it? No, I don't know, but at least I can see if the tubes light up. Okay, snap off this back panel. Oh? You find the trouble, honey? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Let me take it with me. I'll, I'll get it fixed for you. Something as good as new. Okay, honey. Honey, do you believe in second sight? When Jay left here that night, he said if he never comes back, that radio will play. Well, forget about the radio, but he must have known he'd never come back. Yeah, maybe he did know he'd never come back. Maybe he was right about the radio, too. Maybe huh? it will play. I took Gloria home to her apartment, and when I finally got away, I had the radio tucked under my arm. I'll, uh, I'll see you again, won't I? I'll, I'll bring the radio back to you tomorrow, baby. Maybe tonight. Okay, honey. Take care. Don't worry about that, sweetheart. I'll take care, for sure. I walked along a Chicago street I'd never seen before, and all the time I was conscious of the fact that I was being followed. Comrade Mike, of course, in a slow-moving car behind me. At a street corner, there was an empty taxi. Where to? Just drive. What's the trouble, bud? Trouble? What do you mean? Okay, where to? Do you know a place that would repair a radio this time of night? What kind of radio? Portable. Mm. Yeah, maybe I do. It's a garage where I know a guy. You want me to take you there? That's exactly where I want you to take me. garage. Guy's name is George. Uh, want me to wait? No, I, I don't know how long this will take. Okay. 140. Your name is Aronsky, isn't it? Well, what if it is? A.J. Aronsky. License M12659. Look, pal, if you got a beef... Keep your hair on, Aronsky. I was just reading your card. I'm one of those people who remembers everything. Dollar 40. There you are. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, pal. Don't give it a thought. Hello? Hello? George? The clock strikes two o'clock, and it's ten minutes wrong. I was in a small fix-it shop in the front of a garage. George was nowhere, but Comrade Mike's not far behind. Not far. Close. Hello, Comrade. What's the idea of following me, Comrade? Just routine, Comrade. You got your orders, I got mine. So they don't trust me here. Who trusts anybody anywhere? Let's have a look at that radio, comrade. Okay, why? Because you got it in that dame. Give it to me. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't that the idea I was supposed to make friends with that girl? Well, so? So she loves music. She wants me to get a radio fixed tonight. Am I doing wrong, comrade? Look, we trust you. We trust everybody. We trusted comrade Jay. Let's look at that radio. Why, comrade? Because maybe there's a little black book inside it. Give it here. All right, comrade. Here. Yeah. Oh, it's a cute little job, isn't it? Don't suppose it weighs five pounds. Now, what do you think is inside it? I don't know, comrade. You don't know, huh? Nothing. Nothing, comrade? And why'd you bring it here? I told you. To get it fixed. She wants me to get a radio repaired. 
Maybe she's crazy when I get it done this time of night. But would the party want me to refuse? Okay, comrade. It might be a good thing for you to find that book. Here comes Kyle. I'll be outside, but don't you worry, comrade. You won't be alone. Thought I heard somebody out here. Oh, it's, uh, it's this radio. Thought I heard somebody talking to somebody out here. Oh, that was my friends. Out there in the car. Oh, okay. What's the matter with this? Yeah. What's the matter with it? I'll have a look at it. You got a phone? Yeah. Here, under the counter. Local call? Yeah, local call. That'll be 15 cents. You can pay me now. Bev? Hello? Just a second. Making a phone call? I saw you from outside. Thought I might be able to help you. I... I was just... Just calling Glory to tell her I'd be back in a few minutes. I'll tell her for you, huh? Hello? Hello? Who is it? Well, who do you want? What number is it? What number did you want? Let's hope that that right number slash wrong number doesn't get Sovetic into trouble. August 20th, 1952, I was a communist for the FBI. Thank you so much for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE, 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of I Was a Communist with the FBI, starring Dana Andrews, August 20th, 1952. What's the trouble? Wrong number? A real wrong number. What is a number, pal? Let's try it again. Uh, let's forget it. What's the number? Well, I don't remember. Oh, you forgot it so soon? I guess so. I can't find anything wrong with this, mister. Just a tube that was pushed out of the socket. That'll be one buck. No star garage. Radio service. Wait a second. Did you call Michigan 91112? No. No, I didn't. I did. Give me that phone. Hello? Is this the person who called Michigan 91112? That's right. Who's speaking? Who did you want? Nobody. Must have dialed the wrong number. Let's go, huh? Poor Comrade J. <laughs> Doing a job for the FBI, a communist for the FBI. Maybe you ought to feel noble and brave about it. But right now, you're walking along a dark, deserted street with Comrade Mike, one pace behind you. The bulge in his pocket is either a 38 or a 45. At Gloria's place, Mike shoved his gun in my back. Now you look. When we go through the lobby, let's not make any mistakes. Huh, Comrade? No mistakes. All right, move. Now, wait a second. Why do you want to see her? No, either you're a fool or you think I'm a fool. I might have been willing to believe that she didn't know anything about Comrade Jay's little black book until you made that phone call. Now I think I'm going to find out where it is. It may be a little tough for both of you, but I'll find out. Let's go, Comrade. Now, wait, Comrade. Look, you're making a terrible mistake. Why do you think I was sent here? I know why. To check on you, Comrade. Nuts. You don't believe me? How long are you planning to live? Crazy. The party wouldn't do that to me. Wouldn't they? I'm not going to try to convince you. But just think about it for a second before you make a fool of yourself. Nuts. Sure, nuts. But you can't be sure, can you? You can't be sure of anything in the party. Here, look at this card. Here, what is it? Let me see that. Look at it, Comrade. 
The card was nothing but my driver's license, but he took it and stared at it in the dark, and that's all the break I needed. I hit him just right, and he was out like a light, the gun still in his hand. By pure luck, a prowl car came by. I melted into the shadows as the officers picked Comrade Mike up. Now, wait a minute. Put that light on his face again. Yeah, you know who this guy is? He's Mike Dabronski. Why, this guy's wanted for everything. Get him in here. Only a few minutes later, I made my report to the Chicago office of the FBI. Yes? Yes, go on, Svetik. It's a taxi. Illinois 4X1297. Driver A.J. Aronsky. License M12659. You'll find the book that was hidden in the portable radio behind the back seat of the taxi. I think it's important. Anyhow, the commies thought it was important enough to justify a killing. The street in Chicago, dark, deserted, lonely. Why should you be walking alone, comrade? Where are your friends? When you're in the party, you can't have any friends. Where are you going, comrade? What's at the end of the road? You walk in the night and you wonder, what is at the end of the road? But I know. Uh, how well I know. I'm a communist for the FBI. I walk alone. This is Dana Andrews with a word about the story you just heard. The part I portrayed is the part you have to play when you're a communist for the FBI. And it's worth it, a million times over, because at the end of the road is freedom. In this story, as in all others, names, dates, and places are fictitious to protect innocent persons. Many of these stories are based on incidents in the life of Matt Savetic, who worked undercover for the FBI. Next week, another fantastic adventure. Join us, won't you? wondered how he got the book out of the radio in a way where it wasn't found. August 20th, 1952, I was a communist for the FBI on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of the soap opera Claudia. This episode originally broadcast August 20th, 1948. And now, Claudia... That's enough dinner for tonight. If I ever see another carrot, I shall die. What's the matter, Mother? Don't you like carrots? They're coming out of my ears. And very becoming they are, too. Ooh. Did you have to plant so many carrots? No, we haven't planted so many. Just that they all decided to come up at the same time. As a matter of fact, that's something I've been thinking about. Uh-oh. There should be a better way of doing it. So everything doesn't come up at once. If only you had more rabbits on the plate. I'm starting to feel like a rabbit. <laughs> Green rabbits, diced rabbits, stuffed rabbits. I used to love rabbits. Mama's a little carrot happy, David. You'll have to forgive her. Mother, each of these carrots are worth their weight in gold. I suppose you're going to tell me they're 14 carrot carrots. Oh, uh -oh. Mama, you're such a comedian. She beat me to it. <laughs> I never get tired of corn, though, do you? It's a good thing. There's plenty of it around this house. I meant on the cob. Oh. Let's go into the living room before this goes any further. What'll we do tonight? Digest the carrots. But it's a wonderful night to do something more than that, Mama. Well, can't we just stay home and enjoy it? What? Digesting the carrots? We can do that out just as well. Friday night is the night to go out, my man. Your daughter, Mrs. Brown, is afflicted with conventionalism. Oh, all I'm afflicted with is a desire to go out tonight and breathe the air. There's plenty of air around here. Hot air. It will be cooler driving. I didn't mean it that way. She just doesn't know how to take insults, does she, David? Well, she's not bright enough to recognize them. 
Well, now I'm going to sit me down in my chair. Oh, you and your chair. You sound like such an old man, David. Uh -huh. I'm going to read my paper, too. Oh, no, you aren't. You're going to decide what we're going to do tonight? How would you like to go for a drive? No. I'll let you do the driving? You bet you will. Then it's settled. It is not. Hand me my knitting, Claudia. Oh, no, you start knitting and you'll be settled for the night, too. I want to spread my wings tonight. Friday night is the night for spreading wings, is it? What about a movie? You spread wings there? What better place? Oh, it's too crowded. I don't like movies in the summer. Now, that's where you're wrong, Mrs. Brown, and I'll prove it to you. I had to open my mouth. Now, what is the temperature here? At least 85. And in a movie house? Aha, you do not answer. In a movie house, it is freezing, air-conditioned. Each breath you take dripping with icicles. Why, you can even catch cold in a movie house in the summer. And you often do. Is that an inducement? Oh, you always look on the dark side of things. The cold side of things. Then it's subtle we're going to the movies. Well, is there anything decent playing around? You see, Mama, I've won him over. Oh, I'm willing to go to the movies, but I'm not going to waste my time seeing something I don't want to see. Somebody has to stay home with the baby. I volunteer. Don't be so self-sacrificing. I'll stay home with the baby. You will not. I will. That'll be fine, David, because if she stays home, we'll have to stay home and keep her company. If we all stay home, Fritz and Bertha can go to the movie. Fritz and Bertha have probably <laughs> gone, gone to bed already. <laughs> We're all good people belong. Then it's settled we go. But first we have to find out what's playing. I'll not see a romantic picture. You don't like romantic pictures? No. I don't. Nobody asked you, Mama. Why do you, what do you call a romantic picture, David? Well, a romantic picture is a picture in the first scene where the handsome young man b meets the beautiful young woman and he says, Oh, you are so beautiful. Oh, listen. Then in the second scene, the handsome young man finds out that the beautiful young woman has a husband. And he says, Why did this happen to us? That's where the music comes in. Hand me your comb, Mama. Oh, here it is. And he says, Oh, darling, I love you so, but it can never be. My rich old husband would kid you. <laughs> and he says, and then he says, I'd better never see you again. And she says, Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, it's been wonderful while it lasted. <laughs> Nobody ever loved the way we loved, but goodbye. Goodbye. And then in the third scene, the beautiful young woman finds that she cannot live without the handsome young man. She goes to her rich old husband and she tells him. And the rich old husband decides to have the handsome young man destroyed. And then what? And then they lived happily ever afterwards. Ta da dum tum 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 Who like lives happily drum? ever afterwards? The beautiful young girl and the handsome young man. But what happened to the rich old husband? Oh, didn't I tell you? He dies and they accuse the handsome young man of murder. Yes. Well, then the district attorney, who is a schoolboy friend of the handsome young man, mm. finds out that the rich old man had a secretary. What does she have to do with anything? Everything. The district attorney, who was a school friend of the handsome young man, was in love with the secretary. But she had been playing up to the rich old man. But who killed the rich old man? Who knows? You can't leave us hanging like this. That's why we go to the movies. That's why we pay 85 cents to find out who killed the rich old man. Well, let's go. Let's go. I won't sleep till we find out. But, uh... I don't care who killed the rich old man. Oh, clown. Well, that was an exciting movie. Now we don't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be awfully anticlimactic anyway, wouldn't it, Mama? Listen, we're going to be late for every movie in the neighborhood if we don't hurry up. Would you go and see a western, David? Ah, there's more my meat. Good. Buffalo meat. I like the... <laughs> Hi-ho, formaldehyde, the charge of the meddling cattle across the prairie. The expression on the heroine's face, the exquisite courage of the cowboy. The murderous glint in the sheriff's eye. <laughs> Westerns aren't bad, but an awful lot of people get killed for nothing. What a performance, and that's all I get. <laughs> My wife is a tender spirit, Mother. I like the horses in Westerns, but I hate the people. Well, maybe there's a good animal picture animal. around. Good. Then we can send Bluff to the movies and we'll stay home. In a minute, you'll have me believing you don't want to go to the movies. Now, you wouldn't believe that. Honestly. Going to the movies in this family is like undertaking an African expedition. Operations Movies. <laughs> 
Synchronize your watches, women. Let's be underway. Underway? What about underway? a newspaper? We, if we don't decide first what we're going to see and what time it goes on... Oh, Mommy, you're so organized. I just hate walking in in the middle of the picture. I agree with Mom. Because you like to get your money's worth. And you? Well, I don't like it because the seats are warm. Oh, Claudia, there are the newspapers on the window seat. If we're going, for heaven's sake, let's go. Then we won't get home too late. Well, I just love your enthusiasm. Well, we're going, isn't that enough? Now, read off the titles, Mom. Be sure you read tonight's movies. Mm. Mama, what do you take me for? I'd rather not say. Oh, insults. At the cinema? At the, the cinema, cinema. Cinema. Let's see. Mm. In Eastbrook Center is playing Penny for Your Thoughts. Admission, 85 cents. <laughs> Sounds like a romantic picture. It is Betty Stables in it. Sounds horsey, too. And let me see. At the cinema in Eastbrook is playing, um, Hell Bent for Leather. Yeah, obviously, a boots and saddle leather. Mm, I don't think I feel up to such a strenuous picture. They're both so difficult. What's playing at the Redberry? Redberry, Redberry, Redberry. Let, let me see, um, Fine Arts Theater in Redberry. Who Killed Cock Robin? Mystery. Mother, are you interested in Who Killed Cop Cock Robin? Not the least bit. No. I've got it, just the one. In Westbrook is playing the picture I simply must see. I've been dying to see it ever since I read about it in a movie magazine at the hairdressers. Dying to see it? Sounds tragic. What is this lugubrious picture? It's not lugubrious, it's historical. Oh. Lots of beautiful costumes and dueling. You know, with swords. I know, that was the general impression I got, with mm. swords. It takes place during the French Revolution. Mm, I wager you don't even know when the French Revolution was. That is one of the reasons I want to see this picture. I think it would be instructive. Hollywood's idea of history is rarely instructive. You just read different books and they did that, so don't be snobbish, darling. Now, listen, if we start out now, we'll get there just on time. It goes on at 8.5. Hey, just a moment. Since when do you like historical pictures? That's true. Since when? Mm. You usually don't appreciate anything to do with history. I am a mother now. I like historical pictures. Any objections? No, merely surprised and impressed with your intellectual curiosity. What's that got to do with motherhood? Nothing. Hmm? Nothing. You haven't even told us the title of this wonderful picture. It's called Mr. Guillotine. An incisive title, very cutting. He gets his head chopped off. <laughs> he might be rather good at that, David. Well, there's something so final about a guillotine. You're so blasé. As a matter of fact, I should rather like to see it. I've always been interested in the French Revolution. Aha, now I don't have such bad ideas, do I? Every now and then you come through. I'll make a confession. I think that I'll enjoy seeing Mr. Guillotine very much. I certainly would never have accepted your invitation to take you to the movies if it weren't that I thought this was going to be a decent picture. Well, the stone man cracks. What are we waiting for? Let's go. I'm ready. Car waits. Operations movies underway. Underway. Are we almost there? I wouldn't want to be late. Just another couple of blocks. Aren't you glad we went? Instead of sitting at home as if we were married. That would be awful. At least we'll be out early. Oh, the parking space is right in front of the theater. Oh, good. That'll save us time. Mr. Guillotine. Sounds exciting. Yeah, uh, Roger told me that he saw it when it was playing in New York and liked it. Oh, now he confesses, Mama. I bet he had it in the back of his head to go to the movies all evening. Don't jump to conclusions. I hope it's a good, long movie. Maybe there'll be Mickey Mouse, too. Oh, there's a theater right down there. And there's no line. We'll be able to get right in. No line? Well, you know what that means. That means that it can't be such a good picture. Oh! Claudia, what's the matter? Got something in your eye? Well, I must have. I, I'm, I'm not seeing right. Mama, what do you see on the marquee on the theater? Penny for your thoughts. Mm. My thoughts aren't worth that at this moment. David, they must have made a mistake. They, they have the wrong movie advertised. Maybe they've just changed the signs for tomorrow. Drive slowly, darling. Let, let me read what's written. Coming tomorrow... Mr. Guillotine, Saturday through Tuesday. Oh, no! Oh, yes. In other words, Mr. Guillotine is not getting his head chopped off tonight. <laughs> That's not fair. The newspaper the said... The newspaper probably said that it was coming tomorrow. I should have known better by now than to let you look it up. What do we do? Go home. It's a mistake anybody can make, David. Yes, it certainly is. And you made it. Disappointed, Mama? Very. Disappointed, David? Me? Disappointed? Yeah. Very. So am I. So we're even. 
Anyway, it's a lovely night for a drive, isn't it? That's what I wanted to do in the first place. Claudia, are you sure this mistake was a mistake? David, can you ever be sure of anything? Lean over here while I choke you. The average housewife is apt to make lunch a hasty pickup meal if she's alone and in the midst of housework. Well, that's bad. You should eat slowly for digestion's sake. You should relax and enjoy your meals. Include an ice-cold bottle of Coke and see whether lunch isn't a more agreeable, even a more festive occasion, when you lunch refreshed. Well, Mr. King, we never got to the movies, but we did have a lovely drive. Do you think that's what Claudia had in the back of her mind all of the time? Don't quote me, but I think yes. <laughs> she is devious, that girl. Devilish would be a better word. Now I'll confess, Mrs. Brown. It was a pleasant way to spend an evening, wasn't it? Frankly, yes. We had a beautiful drive through some woods I didn't even know existed around here. You see? Again, Claudia was right. That's the worst part of it. I wish she didn't feel she always had to take me along. Well, if Claudia didn't insist, David probably would. They like having you along. I like being along, but it's not always right. On Monday night, I'll see that they go off by themselves. Where to? Well, the summer theatre, perhaps. We'll see. Have a nice weekend, Mr. King. Same to you, Mrs. Brown. Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again Monday at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember... Whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. In this program, Catherine Bard and Paul Crabtree played the parts of Claudia and David, and the entire production is supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. From August 20th, 1948, Claudia here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please thank this station. Support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time you roll around here on your favorite station. If you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. Our shows are always available on demand. Uh, through our webpage, classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows. You can find a link of podcast apps where you can get our shows. You can also learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find our social media links. You can contact me. And if you like what we do, you can buy me a coffee. At Buy Me a Coffee, you can help us uh, uh, find additional great old radio programs through collectors that uh, want us to give them a few bucks. You see, that's how that works. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.